Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. For the first six months of 2016, the, we've seen the global average temperature uh, attain a level 1.3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, which is a phenomenal rise, um, indicates a phenomenal rise in just the last year. Um, in fact, about 20% of the warming that we've had since the pre-industrial has occurred in the last year. So temperature, temperatures are spiraling upwards rapidly. We need to declare a global climate change emergency for that and for many other reasons that I've discussed. Many parts of the world are getting a lot hotter than they were before and we're seeing extended heat waves. In fact, we're facing a large heat wave in the US right now. In parts of the Middle East, we reached a temperature of 54 degrees Celsius or 100, oh, that's over 129 degrees Fahrenheit. So how do we stay cool uh, in, in such uh, conditions? How do we survive in fact? I mean, the wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees Celsius and 100% humidity is a point where the body can no longer sweat to cool down. So if you're outside under such conditions with no protection, you can't basically survive the day out there. You get heat exhaustion, heat sunstroke, heat stroke, and your body core temperature rises and you get out of equilibrium and perish. So I'm gonna discuss the latest sports science on keeping yourself cool this summer. This is based on a great article by Alex Hutchinson in Canada's Globe and Mail. So in terms of the Ottawa Marathon, 47,000 runners were gearing up to race. They got a notice just before the race was gonna start that race day highs were gonna be over 30, so a lot of races could be canceled. So summer heat is a serious and sometimes insurmountable barrier to prolonged exercise. Anytime you're above 21 degrees Celsius with 50% humidity, the, the, the number of runners in a race, for example, needing medical attention can quickly rise and swamp resources. Similar things are facing Olympic athletes in Rio soon. Uh, forecasts in the upper 20s and average humidity above 70 percent so it raises the risk so sport federations around the world have teams of psychologists studying the best ways to handle hot weather so I'll talk about some of the things that they've learned and any of us can apply this to survive uh, heat waves so it's not just the heat it's not just the heat and the humidity which we talk about humidex it's also the the, it's something called the wet bulb globe temperature. It, it incorporates air temperature and humidity, which is humidex, but also wind speed and solar radiation. So it assesses how hot we actually feel. Um, it arrived, um, it arose from US military studies, I think in the 50s. But me so measuring the wet bulb globe temperature isn't easy. You have to have a specialized wet bulb thermometer, which, which gets the humidex, humidity and which, which measures the effects of humidity and wind and temperature. You need a globe thermometer to measure the effects of solar radiation. So how do you actually you know, measure these things? And you know, what are the categories? So here we have the wet bulb globe temperature. If you're below 80, no risk. Low risk, 80 to, 80 to 85 basically. Moderate risk, 85 to 80, 88 approximately. High risk, 88 to 90. And above 90, extreme risk. And in terms of light work, moderate work and heavy work, the work rest periods, if you're working or resting, those are the number of minutes of continuous activity you can do. And this is your intake required in water to stay hydrated under the for light moderate and heavy work and of course you know um this assumes that you're basically uh you know uh th th these numbers vary depending on your whether you're unacclimated or acclimatized it, if you're acclimatized you have to have five days of exposure to this heat and 20% of full exposure on day one, increasing 20% per day, and then you're fully acclimatized. Um, and if you're, depends on what you're wearing. These numbers, these numbers above are for fully clothed with humans with lightweight summer working clothes. 
If you have heavier clothing, you need to add two units to the wet bulb globe temperature with cotton coveralls, four units with winter type clothing, etc. And the, the, the work levels are defined here, you know, rest for all the way from rest to heavy work. So this is basically the wet bulb globe temperature category. Um, how do you measure it practically? Um, this is just Google images on wet bulb globe temperature. And you can see the devices here, different types of devices that can be used. Okay, so they measure, so this guy here would measure temperature without wind. You'd have a, you'd have a wet bulb uh, sensor incorporating the wind and uh, humidity. And then you'd have a, um, you'd have a globe uh, thermometer there to measure solar radiation. Okay, so there's all these different devices and so on and tables talking about wet bulb globe temperature heat exposures. So researchers recently in Japan and Britain had this study and they had volunteers cycle to exhaustion in a chamber, 30 degrees C heat, 50% humidity. And what they did, the only thing they did was they varied the solar radiation. So they wanted to see the additional effect of solar radiation. And it's very important, much more important than people realize. So they simulated darkness was zero, full sunlight, 800 watts per square meter, um, thin and thick clouds. Thin clouds would be 500 watts per square meter and thick clouds, 250 watts per square meter. They published their work recently. So the average time to exhaustion was cut in half from about 45 minutes with no sun to 22 minutes with full sun. So the solar radiation didn't change the core temperature, but it did raise the skin temperature. So marathoners are right. Um, experienced runners know that the cloudy days produce the fastest marathons, and this is the reason. So, you know, why when the skin temperature is higher, do you reach exhaustion sooner? One my theory is that you feel hotter. Um, it, like it definitely raises the skin temperature, the solar radiation makes you feel hotter, could divert blood from the muscles to the skin, making your, your muscles um, um, crater more quickly, reach exhaustion more quickly. Uh, so here are some actual details from the study. Um, I'll just, this is a study here, um, effects of solar radiation on endurance exercise capacity in a hot environment, just came out April of 2016, so very recently. So just looking at the data, this is the estimated time to exhaustion in minutes, so dark, uh, full sunlight, 22 minutes, full darkness, 45 minutes approximately, you know, sort of not quite linear, but tapering off, but a significant drop, you know, so this, the solar intensity has a huge difference on the time to exhaustion for working out. This is a rectal thermometer, and this is skin thermometer, average over the body. Um, so the rectal thermometer is measuring sort of core body temperature, of course, it goes up as you exercise, but there's not a significant difference depending on the solar radiation. So the solar impact is not changing your core temperature significantly. But in this case, there's a big difference in these curves from the lowest curve is darkness and the highest curve is full sunlight. So this is why the time to exhaustion is much quicker. It's because the skin temperature is changing, not the core temperature. And different parts of the body different parts of the skin temperature uh, go up different amounts. So this is the temperature of the chest. Um, this is of the uh, upper arm. This is of the thigh. And this is of the calf. So these skin temperatures, you know, to, ex to with different solar radiation, it shows you that the skin temperature is varying. It, so it, it's rising in different parts of the body on the skin in different amounts. So this is a very interesting study. Um, so here's an experiment for you. Douse yourself in, if you have ice cold water and you wanna cool yourself down, are you better off drinking it or dumping it on your head? Okay, so these guys did this study recently. Okay, if you drink, if you swallow cold water, they, you lost 39 kilojoules of heat. And this is because the body 
is warming up the water to body temperature. So that cold water is warmed up to your core temperature, roughly 37 Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. And so your body is losing 39 kilojoules of heat, some cooling. Now, if it, if it was ice slush instead of water, it's 81 kilojoules of heat from this study. This is because of the latent heat. You need more energy to melt the ice than you do to heat water. But the best option is pouring it on your head and letting it evaporate. You'll lose 607 kilojoules, which dwarfs these other numbers. So you get much more cooling from just pouring it over your head. Of course, that's if 100% of it cools you. But, you know, the caveat, if 85% of it is spilled onto the ground and only 15% goes on your body, then 15% of this number is, is over 90, which is still better than the ice slush. And also, if you're already sweating, so that sweat's dripping to the ground, you've maxed out your ability to evaporate water. So pouring it on your head won't help as much if you're already sweating tremendously. So, sweat, so pouring it on your head is best on dry, windy days or if you're cycling, creating your own wind. So the best advice to runners and cyclists, take two cups of water at each water station, one to drink and the other to pour it over your head to gain the benefits from both. Now, what about pre-cooling before races? So, so the Netherlands Olympic Committee, they have these new cooling vests that their athletes will be wearing at Rio. So these are form-fitting vests. There's a hydrogel in them. You soak them with water and the water, there's evaporative cooling for up to 72 hours. The water is released from the hydrogel pores and evaporates and it cools your body. You can also pre-freeze them to get an extra chill. Um, and this is becoming standard practice for athletes competing in hot conditions. So there's cooling um, vests, there's cooling gloves, there's cooling scarves, um, or even drinking pre-race ice slushies. The Australian Institute of Sport shipped slushy machines to the 2008 Olympics in Beijing to do this. So there's still debate on pre-cooling, but what do these suits look like? Well, this is the uh, Dutch cooling vest. Um, so it just, it's just a vest. Uh, you fill it with water, half a liter it says here, and you zip it up and you get evaporative cooling from the outside, which carries away heat from your body, cooling your body. There's also other companies, for example, this is IZI body cooling devices, and they, they talk about uses in industry, in sport, in medical, pets coming soon, cool your pet with a vest. Of course, all of these evaporative cooling jackets will only work if the humidity is not 100%. If the humidity is 100%, then um, you're not going to get evaporation. These things aren't going to do any cooling. You can also do evaporative cooling on your house, for example. If you have a flat roof, you know, put water on your roof on a hot summer day, the water will evaporate off and cool your house. Um, and in fact, that's been used before. So. You know, the, but it, there's still, the, the pros and cons are still being debated. So if you drink a slushy, it may be too effective, according to the, the University of Sydney people, because there's un, temperature sensors in your stomach that were previously unknown. So if you drink a slushy, your stomach says, okay, it, 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 it lowers the temperature in your stomach, that tricks your body into thinking you're cold and reduces your sweat rate. So that can cause you to actually heat up more. You now, if you drink a hot tea, for example, that would tell your stomach that you're hotter, so the sweat weight rate would increase of your body, and that would cool you down. So drinking a cup of hot tea is what some people argue uh, cools them down. Um, it's the best thing to do on a hot day. So the devil is in the details. You know, if you're sweating so much that sweat's dripping to the ground, then reducing your sweat rate won't help you, so a slushy could help cool you. Okay, and there's also the physiological benefit. Um, so basically, you know, the race in Ottawa, there was, uh, you know, they, they basically staggered the starting times to when it was cooler. There were clouds that day. They had the great race. But the more we know about, about, about the body and how it reacts to heat, the better off we can be and the better off we'll, we'll be able to design things. So you can't use evaporative cooling um, in all cases, but you can um, in some cases. So, um, you know, this just shows you have the core temperature, you have a skin temperature. Um, this is when you're cold, the, the core sort of tightens up. 